Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, I welcome you all in this 16th session of the course of administrative law. In earlier sessions, we have already discussed the principles of natural justice, the power of the courts in the matters of judicial review, the powers of the courts of judicial review, the different grounds of judicial review on which the court can exercise the power of judicial review and then also the modes, various modes by which the judicial review can be exercised by the Supreme Court of India and the high courts on administrative action. In the same line of our discussion, in the continuation to the earlier discussion, in this present lecture, I will discuss, I will focus on the administrative tribunals. The administrative tribunals have become very significant in the regime of welfare state because of the intensification of the functions and powers of the administrative bodies. It was felt that some way outs to determine the disputes, particularly those disputes wherein the administration itself is involved, should be evolved, should be discovered. To lower down the burden of already overburdened courts and for this purpose, the tribunalization of justice was done. The tribunals started to be established to deal with the different aspects of administrative disputes or the disputes wherein the administration is a party. So, for administrative decision making, for the purpose of administrative adjudication, some formal way outs or so formal forum to decide the dispute was discovered in the form of tribunals. When we introduce to the tribunals, we can say that there has been a remarkable intensification in the functions and powers of the government during the regime of welfare state. This aspect of intensification, the increase, the growth in the functions and powers of the state we have already dealt with. During the discussion over the introduction to administrative law and specifically on the subtopic, on the discussion over subtopic, the transformation from laissez fair to welfare state, that how the state assumed more and more powers and how the intensification of the powers and functions, the growth and increase in the powers and functions was there. This growth increase in the powers and functions of the state, this intensification of the functions of the state or the administration resulted into the direct contact, interaction and also the conflict between individuals and the administration. The administration started to put more restrictions on the freedoms of individuals for public good or for preserving the community interest because the concept of welfare state was evolved or it, it, it developed, it grew with an objective of 
ensuring the welfare of the common people and therefore there was the direct contact direct interaction and which also resulted into the conflicts between the individual and the administration there was the increase in the litigation also because of constant friction between individuals and the authorities new kinds of disputes arose where the administration is involved as one party to the dispute these disputes were not existent during the regime of laissez faire state but during the regime of welfare state because of the direct contract because of the direct interaction because of the friction between the individual and the administration new or kinds of disputes arose this was the starting point of the process of administrative adjudication wherein the administration itself started to adjudicate the disputes between the administration and the individual there has always been suspicion about the impartiality and independence of administrative authorities when the department to which such an authority belongs is itself the party to the case it is certainly the question of doubt or suspicion that when an official of the department is authorized to make the decision on such a dispute wherein the same office or the same department to which he belongs is involved as a party and to rule out such kind of doubts or suspicions such kind of possibility of bias it was realized that some formal method should be evolved for adjudicating for deciding such kinds of disputes there was the need of an effective impartial and independent system of determination of disputes outside the courts this is also very significant fact that if the disputes between the administration and the individual are allowed to go or to be entertained by the ordinary civil courts then there would be the difficulty to implement or enforce the policies which are being introduced by the state by the administration to ensure the welfare of the people of the country and therefore it was realized that there must be any such kind of dispute determination or any such kind of technique or method to determine the disputes between the administration and the state particularly which disputes belong to the implementation or enforcement of newer socio economic policies being introduced by the administration being introduced by the state wherein the impartiality the independence the neutrality and effectiveness can be ensured such a dispute settling system was evolved in the form of the tribunals and it seems to be the starting point of tribunalization of justice when the tribunals started to be established to make the determination of the disputes relating to the administration thus the tribunals are free from any kind of administrative and political control because the tribunals are separate and distinct from any independent in from tribunals are separate and distinct from the departments the offices and independent of the administration so such an independent and impartial technique was evolved in the form of tribunals and therefore we can say that the tribunals are free from any kind of administrative and political control earlier before the introduction of the tribunals that these disputes were being decided by the officials of the department and there was a strong possibility of bias on the part of the officials of the department when the department was itself the party to the dispute to the case 
and therefore such impartial and independent tribunals were established which are not under the control of any department under the supervision of any department and they were established as the independent and impartial forum to settle such kind of disputes. The system of tribunals has been designed in such a way that they may decide impartially and independently the cases arising between the administration and the individuals. As to the meaning of the term tribunal, it seems that the term tribunal does not have any precise or fixed meaning. It is used in several senses. If we go through the dictionary meaning of the word tribunal, it refers to the seat of judge. When the term tribunal refers to the seat of judge, in this sense, a court may also include it with the meaning of tribunal. In the area of administrative law, the term tribunal is used in a distinctive reference. The term tribunal is used in a distinctive meaning or meaning distinctive than the meaning given in dictionaries. And it this meaning in which the term tribunal is used in the area of administrative law or area of administrative adjudication, it refers to all adjudicatory authorities outside the scope of conventional courts of the country. So, the term tribunal refers to all the adjudicatory bodies, all the adjudicatory authorities, the administrative authorities which are exercising quasi judicial functions, which are exercising the judicial, which are performing the judicial functions. So, it refers to all the adjudicatory, administrative adjudicatory bodies outside the scope of conventional courts of the country. Sometimes the term tribunal is used in an extensive sense to refer all quasi judicial bodies exercising adjudicatory powers, irrespective of the fact that they are independent of administration or not. So, we can say that the term tribunal is used in three senses on this basis. Number one, the term tribunal refers to the seat of judge wherein it also includes the courts, all those bodies which are engaged in the administration of justice are included within such a meaning. Then the term tribunal refers to those adjudicatory bodies which are outside the scope or the meaning of the conventional courts, that is the tribunals, which are independent of the departments. In its extensive sense or intensive sense, the term tribunal is also used to refer all those quasi judicial bodies, whether these are within the control of the department or these are independent of the departments. It means that in this sense the officials, ministers or the departments in performing adjudicatory functions, in exercising adjudicatory powers may also be characterized as the tribunal. In the case of Durga Shankar Mehta versus Aguraj Singh, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1954, our apex court observes that the expression tribunal as used in article 136 does not mean the same thing as court, but includes within its range all adjudicating bodies provided that they are established by state and are endowed with judicial functions. This meaning given to the term tribunal by the Supreme Court of India in Durga Sankar Mehta case refers to all adjudicating bodies subject to two conditions. Number one, that they are established by the state and number two, these are endowed with the judicial functions. So, if the state establishes any body and it endows that body with the 
judicial functions, then it may be termed as tribunal in accordance to the meaning given to the term tribunal in the case of Durga Shankar Mehta by the Supreme Court of India. We can understand the meaning and status of tribunals by observing the meaning of the term by the Supreme Court of India in the case of Associated Cement Company Limited versus P. N. Sharma, which was decided in 1965 by our Supreme Court. According to the meaning given by the apex court to the term tribunal in this case, a tribunal may possess some but not all the trappings of the court. From functional point of view, an administrative tribunal, neither a judicial body nor exclusively an administrative body, but somewhere between the two. So, we can understand the nature of the tribunals as per the meaning given to the term tribunal by the Supreme Court in this case, wherein the Supreme Court says that the tribunals do not have all the trappings of court, but they may have some similarities or some characteristics or some trappings of the court. The tribunals are neither the purely judicial bodies nor the purely administrative bodies. They are found or they are stated in between these two. Therefore, the tribunal is found to be situated, to be stood in between these two, the courts and the executive bodies having some trappings of the courts and some trappings of the executive bodies. The evolution and the growth of administrative tribunals, it has been a noteworthy happening, noteworthy incidence during the 19th and 20th century. There has been a quest of search for an effective alternative mechanism to deal with the service litigation and to relieve already overburdened formal courts from the burden of such litigation. We know that there are number of cases, huge volume of cases is there relating to the service matters and therefore, there has been a continuous consistent appeal, consistent demand, consistent quest for the search of an alternative effective mechanism which could deal with the service matters and which could relieve the courts, formal courts from the burden of the service litigation which are already overburdened. In the quest of such kind of search, we may refer to some demands or some recommendations made by the different bodies for the establishment of the service tribunals in India. In 1958, the Law Commission of India in its 14th report on freedom of judicial administration recommended for the establishment of tribunals for deciding service matters. In 1958 itself, it was recommended by the Law Commission of India that there must be the service tribunals to deal with the matters of service. In 1969, the Administrative Reforms Committee in its report on personal administration recommended for the establishment of service tribunals at center and the states both. Then the Justice Saha Committee was appointed to inquire into the matter of desirability of service tribunals in India and the committee chaired by Justice Sah also recommended for setting up the service tribunals in India. In addition to this, in 1980, one case was decided by the Supreme Court in the name of KK Datta versus Union of India and in KK Datta versus Union of India, our Supreme Court recommended for the establishment of the service tribunals in India. This 
was the background in which 42nd amendment was done in the constitution to, to take note of this consistent demand of the need to establish administrative service tribunals in India. 42nd amendment was dealing with the different matters, several matters that was very big amendment in the constitution and it also took note of the demands or recommendations being made for the establishment of service tribunals in India. The 42nd amendment to the constitution introduced a new part, part 14th A and this part 14th A included article 323A and 323B providing for the establishment of administrative tribunals in India. Parliament amended the constitution under its constituent power by exercising its constituent power under article 368 and included two new articles and one new part to our constitution. Article 323A and article 323B were included by this amendment in the constitution and these both the articles and part 14th A was aimed at the establishment of the tribunals, different kind of tribunals in India. See article 323A. The marginal note of article 323A is administrative tribunals. Clause 1 of article 323A provides that parliament may by law provide for the adjudication or trial by administrative tribunals of disputes and complaints with respect to recruitment and conditions of service of persons appointed to public services and post in connection with the affairs of the union or of any state or of any local or other authority within the territory of India or under the control of the government of India or of any corporation owned or controlled by the government. By reading clause 1 of article 323A, we can understand that what was the intention of parliament as to the scope of such administrative tribunals? What kind of matters the parliament intended to refer to the tribunals for its determination? Number one, the disputes involving the matters relating to the conditions of service and the matters of recruitment were to be referred to the tribunals for their determination. The parliament could provide for any such mechanism. The parliament could establish the tribunals to deal with these matters and recruitment of conditions of service of which post the persons appointed to public services, not private services, only public services and post in connection with the affairs of the union or any state. We also know the definition or the meaning of state as it is given in article 12 of our constitution. It seems that the same has been included in article 323A when the parliament included the union, the state, the local authorities, the other authorities and any corporations owned or controlled by the government. The same test was applied as it was interpreted by the courts to expand the meaning of article 12. Though in article 12 itself, only the union parliament, union government, state uh, assembly, state legislature and the state governments, local authorities and other authorities are expressly included. For in the interpretation of the term other authorities, any such corporations which are either controlled or either owned by, owned by the government are also included within the meaning of state. So, any services, any public services or any services under the government of India or under the state governments could be included within the scope of the tribunals. 
clause 2 of article 323a states that a law made under clause 1 may number 1 provide for the establishment of an administrative tribunal for the union and a separate administrative tribunal for each state or for two or more states. There were three options with the parliament. Parliament could establish two options for the parliament. The parliament could establish separately the separate tribunals for each state and one central tribunal. The parliament could establish the central administrative tribunal and the joint tribunals for the states. B. It may specify the jurisdiction, powers and authority which may be exercised by each of the said tribunals. So, it was also given the authority to parliament, this authority was also given to the parliament to provide for or to specify the jurisdiction of these tribunals which are to be established by parliament under sub clause A of clause 2. C. Provide for the procedure to be followed by the said tribunals. So, the jurisdiction or the powers both were to be specified by procedures both were to be specified by the parliament. D. This was very broad power which was given to the parliament under clause D, sub clause D of clause 2 of article 323A, wherein the parliament could exclude the jurisdiction of all courts except the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under article 136 with respect to the disputes or complaints referred to in clause 1. What does it mean? That the parliament by making the law could establish the central administrative tribunal, state administrative tribunals or the joint administrative tribunals for two or more states. There were the three options with the parliament and the parliament could specify the jurisdiction of those tribunals. The parliament could provide for the procedure to be followed by these tribunals in making the adjudication. And even the parliament could exclude the jurisdiction of all the courts and could base that jurisdiction in the tribunals. Even the jurisdiction given to the high courts and to some extent to the Supreme Court of India under Article 32. This is very broad power which was conferred on parliament. With respect to the disputes complaints referred to in clause 1. E. The parliament could provide for the transfer to each such administrative tribunal of any case pending before any court or other authority immediately before the establishment of such tribunal as would have been within the jurisdiction of such tribunal if the causes of action on which such suits or proceedings are based had arisen after such establishment. The parliament could repeal or amend any order made by the president under clause 3. Next, contains such supplemental, incidental and consequential provisions as parliament may deem necessary for the effective functioning of and for the speedy disposal of cases by and the enforcement of the orders of such tribunals. The provisions of this article shall have effect notwithstanding anything in any other provision of this constitution or in any other law for the time being in force. It is also a sweeping provision like sub clause D of clause 2 that the provisions of this article shall have effect notwithstanding anything in any other provisions of this constitution or in any other law for the time being in force. Article 323b provided for the establishment of tribunals for other matters. 323A was specifically devoted to the establishment of the administrative service tribunals and 323B was devoted to the tribunals for other matters. 
Clause 1 of Article 323b states that the appropriate legislature may by law provide for the adjudication or trial by tribunals of any disputes, complaints or offences with respect to all or any of the matters specified in clause 2 with respect to which such legislature has power to make the law. See clause 2, the matters referred to in clause 1 are the following namely, number 1, levy, assessment, collection and enforcement of any tax. So, for the purpose of taxation, the tribunals could be established, foreign exchange, import and export across customs frontier, customs frontiers, industrial and labor disputes, land reforms by way of acquisition by the state of any state as defined in article 31a or of any rights therein or the extinguishment or modification of any such rights or by way of sealing on agricultural land or in any other way. Sealing of urban property also the tribunals could be established for the purpose of election to either house of parliament or the house of either house of the legislature of a state, but excluding the matters referred to in article 329 and article 329a. So, for all these purposes which are mentioned in this provision, the tribunals could be established, introduced by the parliament by making the law. Then clause 3 which is similar to the clause 2 of 323a provides that a law which is made under clause 1 by the parliament may provide for the establishment of a hierarchy of tribunals. It could again specify the jurisdiction powers and authority which may be exercised by each of the said tribunals, provide for the procedure to be followed by the said tribunals. Again the parliament was given the power that the law which is to be made by parliament could exclude the jurisdiction of all the courts except the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under article 136 with respect to all or any of the matters falling within the jurisdiction of said tribunals. So, the tribunals could be given the status of high courts and to some extent the status of the Supreme Court also. These are the different aspects of Article 323A and 323B. The Indian Parliament exercised the power conferred on it by Article 323A. We are concerned with the tribunals which are mentioned in Article 323A, that is, the Administrative Service Tribunals for the purpose of this lecture. So, by exercising the power conferred on the parliament under article 323a our parliament enacted the administrative tribunal act 1985 for the establishment of the administrative service tribunals in india to determine the service matters of civil servants of union and states it is important for us to know some key provisions of the Administrative Tribunal Act 1985. Section 4 of 19, uh, uh, Section 4 of the Administrative Tribunal Act 1985 provides for the establishment of administrative tribunals. It declares that the administrative tribunals are established. Section 5 makes the provisions for the composition of tribunals and its benches. Section 6 prescribes qualifications for a person to be appointed as chairman, vice chairman and the members of the tribunal. Section 7 of the Administrative Tribunal Act 1985 authorizes the vice chairman to act as chairman or to discharge his functions in certain circumstances. Section 8 of the Act specifies the term of office of chairman, vice chairman, 
and the members of the tribunal. Section 9 provides for resignation and removal. Section 10 provides for the salaries and allowances and other terms and conditions of service of chairman and the members of the tribunal. Section 14 confers the jurisdiction, powers and authority on the central administrative tribunal. Section 15 confers similar jurisdiction, powers and authority on state administrative tribunals because the administrative tribunal act 1985 established both the CAT and the SAT, the central administrative tribunal and the state administrative tribunals provides for the establishment of these two kinds of tribunals. And therefore, the section 5 of the administrative tribunals act 1985 confers the jurisdiction powers and authority on state administrative tribunals. Section 17 confers the powers to punish for contempt. So, the tribunal could also punish for the contempt. It is very significant fact which is to be understood, which is to be pointed out that the power to punish the contempt was given only to the high courts and the Supreme Court of India being the court of records. The power to punish the contempt was not given to any other adjudicatory body or any other court except the high courts and the supreme court. But section 17 of administrative tribunals act 1985 confers the powers on the tribunals to punish for their contempt. Section 28 of administrative tribunals act 1985 provides for the exclusion of jurisdiction of courts except the Supreme Court under Article 136 of the Constitution. Section 14, Section 15, Section 16 and Section 28, these has been the center of controversy from very outset, from very beginning of the enactment of 1985 Tribunals, Administrative Tribunals Act and even from the amendment of the Constitution the clause 2D of article 323A and clause 3D of article 323B, these has been the issue of debate, issue of discussion, the issue of controversy because very broad powers have been given, have been conferred on the parliament under those clauses of article 323A and B to exclude the jurisdiction of the high courts and the supreme courts with respect to the matters to be decided by the tribunals and thus the tribunals could be given the status of high courts, the tribunals could be given the status of even supreme court to some extent which may be violative of the concept of judicial review and therefore these provisions of the administrative tribunal act and article 323. A and B which excluded the jurisdiction of the high courts was were became the subject of controversy, the subject of debate and the subject of discussion. Section 28 of the Administrative Tribunals Act 1985 excluded the jurisdiction of high courts, excluded the jurisdiction of all the courts except the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under article 136 of Indian constitution and therefore, the issue of the constitutionality of such administrative tribunals, the issue of the constitutionality of the central administrative tribunal and the state administrative tribunals came into existence or became very serious issue. As we have already discussed under the topic of power of judicial review, 
that the power of judicial review of the high courts and the power of judicial review of the Supreme Court of India has been considered to be the essential feature of basic structure of constitution from very outset of the evolution of the doctrine of basic structure in Keswanand Bharti case itself. And from Keswanand Bharti to till date, the judicial review has always been considered to be the essential feature of the basic structure of our constitution. And we also know the fact that according to the doctrine of basic structure, if any particular provision, any particular aspect, any particular principle is established, is considered to be the part of basic structure of Indian constitution, it cannot be taken away, it cannot be changed, it cannot be altered even by the plenary power to amend the Indian constitution given to the parliament. So, the parliament cannot make such an amendment which affects adversely the power of judicial review of the higher judiciary in India. But in 42nd amendment, it was done. When the 42nd amendment was made, the parliament was given the power under clause 2D of article 323A and under clause 3D of article 323B to exclude the power of judicial review of high court and to some extent to the of the Supreme Court also by making the provision that the parliament could exclude the jurisdiction of all the courts except the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under article 136 with respect to all or any matter to be disposed of, to be adjudicated, to be determined by the tribunal or to be assigned for the determination of the tribunal by parliament. So, this was very sweeping power which was given to the parliament. So, there were two fold questions with regard to the constitutionality, with regard to the constitutional validity of the administrative tribunals. One was relating to the constitutional amendment, which is the source of the power given to parliament to establish the tribunals and to provide for the jurisdiction, the powers, the procedure to those tribunals and also to exclude the jurisdiction of the courts with respect to the matters assigned to the tribunals for its determination. So, the constitutional validity of that amendment, the constitutional validity of article 323A, 323B as included by the parliament through 42nd amendment was one question relating to the constitutional validity of the administrative tribunals in India. The second important question relating to the constitutional validity of the administrative tribunals in India was with respect to the provisions of 1985, the Administrative Tribunals Act, which was enacted by the parliament under the exercise of its powers given through article 323A. The constitution, the question of constitutional validity of administrative tribunals or the constitutional validity of the Administrative Tribunal Act 1985 was challenged before the apex court, before the Supreme Court of India in the case of S.P. Sampath Kumar versus Union of India. This S.P. Sampath Kumar versus Union of India was decided in 1987 by the Supreme Court. The ground on which the constitutional validity of the Administrative Tribunal Act 1985 was challenged, was put in question 
was that the act has taken away the power of judicial review of high courts. That was very important question before the Supreme Court in the case of SP Sampath Kumar versus Union of India that the power of judicial review of high courts has been taken away by this enactment because section 28 excludes the jurisdiction section 14 15 16 confers the jurisdiction on the tribunal and 28 excludes the jurisdiction of all the courts except the jurisdiction of the supreme court of india under 136 this was the main ground of fundamental ground of challenge the exclusion of the power of judicial review of high courts violates the basic structure of Indian constitution. That ground was also taken that the power of judicial review was taken away and taking away the power of judicial review by way of amendment is also unconstitutional because the judicial review is the essential feature of the basic structure of our constitution. And this essential feature of the basic structure of our constitution cannot be taken away even by making the amendment of Indian constitution. So, the very source of the power given to the parliament or given to the tribunals was, invalid, was challenged to be invalid. In Sampath Kumar case, the Administrative Tribunal Act was challenged on two grounds as I mentioned to be very clear that what were the grounds on which the constitutional validity of Administrative Tribunal Act 1985 was challenged. We are to specify thus these two were the basic grounds number one that the Administrative Tribunal Act 1985 excluded the jurisdiction of all the courts except the jurisdiction of at Supreme Court of India under Article 136. And number two, the exclusion of the power of judicial review is the violation of the doctrine of basic structure of Indian constitution. It means that both the constitutional validity of Administrative Tribunal Act 1985 and the constitutional validity of the 42nd amendment to include article 323a and 323b both were challenged in this case. The court though recognized the judicial review as the part of basic structure and the concept of vital importance and vital principle of Indian constitution. But in Sampath Kumar case, the court was not agreed that why excluding the jurisdiction of high court was violative of the basic structure or was amounting to take away the power of judicial review of the high court. The Supreme Court no doubt recognized the power of judicial review as the part of basic structure. There was no disagreement in the bench as to the principle as to the fact that the judicial review is the essential feature of the basic structure of Indian constitution. It was very well recognized. But the Supreme Court says that though the power of judicial review is the essential feature of basic structure of our constitution, it is very vital principle of Indian constitution, but there was no violation of basic structure doctrine by the exclusion of the jurisdiction of the high courts. The main question in the Sampath Kumar case was whether the administrative tribunals were substitute to the high courts or these were the supplements to the high courts. What was the status of the administrative tribunals? The court acknowledged the authority of the parliament to provide for any alternative institutional mechanism. The court was of the view that the parliament could provide for any alternative institutional mechanism to 
exercise the power of judicial review. The power of judicial review no doubt has been vested in the high courts and the Supreme Court of India. But if the parliament wishes, it can provide for, it can establish any alternative institutional mechanism to exercise the power of judicial review and it can give the power of judicial review to that particular institution. It would not amount to be the exclusion of or to be the taking away of the power of judicial review if the parliament establishes any effective alternative institution to exercise the power of judicial review by the high courts and the supreme court. In providing for such an alternative institutional mechanism, the parliament can establish an alternative institution to replace the high courts for the purpose of judicial review. The tribunal in question was considered to be the substitute of high court in service matters. The tribunal in question that is the administrative service tribunal was considered to be the substitute of high court in service matters. There was the question whether the high court, whether the tribunals were substitute or supplement. The tribunal was considered to be the substitute of the high court. The court emphasized that excluding the jurisdiction of high courts in certain matters and investing it in any other alternative institution cannot be a valid ground to challenge the constitutional validity of the act. The court insisted that such alternative institution should be a real substitute of the high court. This was the condition which was imposed, not only in form, appearance and de jure, but also in power, content and de facto it should be the real substitute of high court in all facets. Therefore, the court evaluated and examined the composition of the tribunal to ensure that whether it is a real substitute of high courts and pointed out some defects in the composition and structure of the tribunal. You can see that these are the defects which were pointed out by the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court recommended to remove these effects. Then the L. Chandra Kumar versus Union of India case comes. In Sampad Kumar case, the tribunals were considered to be the substitute of the high courts. Then this decision was reconsidered by the Supreme Court in L. Chandra Kumar case. In L. Chandra Kumar case, the Supreme Court established the principle that the statutory courts cannot be given the status of constitutional courts. Tribunals are established by the law, by the statute, whereas the high courts and Supreme Court are established by the constitution itself. Therefore, the statutory courts cannot be given the status of the constitutional courts on the basis of this principle. The Supreme Court of India in L. Chandra Kumar case declared clause 2D of article 223A and clause 3D of article 323B as violative of the principle of basic structure of Indian constitution. Power of judicial review of the constitutional courts is a part of basic structure and the statutory courts cannot be given the status of the constitutional courts. The tribunals can determine the constitutionality of any statutory provisions except the provisions of the parent act. The exercise of this power shall be subject to the examination by the division bench of the high court. They can deal with the service matters, but they cannot enjoy the same status as it is enjoyed by the high courts and the Supreme Court of India. The tribunals were considered only to the supplements and thus the question of the validity or constitutionality of the administrative tribunals was settled by the Supreme Court of India in L. Chandra Kumar case. Now, against the decisions of the administrative tribunals, the appeal lies in the high courts and the tribunals are only the supplements to the high court. They cannot be the substitute to the high court. They cannot be given the status similar to the high courts. Thank you.
Hello, good morning everybody. I am uh, Raghunandan Sengupta. So, I will just give you uh, the a very brief uh, excitement area of finance which is quantitative finance and that has a huge market starting around about 10 years back and it is exploding exponentially. So, what uh, do we mean by quantitative finance? Quantitative finance is actually the application of different mathematical and statistical techniques in the area of financial markets, be it say for example, derivative pricing, be it in the area of say for example, portfolio management, be it in the area of asset liability management, be it in the area of portfolio management. We see that the application has exploded in such a way that there is a huge opportunity for people who have a quantitative background in mathematics and statistics, they can utilize those in the area of finance, but obviously with some prior knowledge of, of, of uh, finance as a subject. Now, when we say about quantitative finance, as I said, it is an area of applied mathematics and statistics applied in, in financial markets. Use of different areas, if somebody is interested to know, we have stochastic calculus, we have derivative pricing, we have operation research, we have quantitative techniques like differential uh, equations, stochastic calculus, time series and they are heavily used in the area of quantitative finance as I mentioned. Now, we all know that in 2000, in 1997, the Nobel Prize in Economics, so it is basically the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was given to the work of Merton and Scholz in the area of derivative pricing. And after that, there has been an exponential increase in the area of, of quantitative techniques in, in, in quantitative finance and the, in the area of, of different type of derivative pricing. With the advent, moreover with the advent of, of high-ended and sophisticated computing data, big data has come in a very big way where application areas starting from computing, from different type of algorithm design have been taken up in such a big way that nowadays at least we are able to understand that how high frequency data algorithm trading can be utilized using the concept of quantitative finance in the area of, of finance as such. But there is a flip side also, obviously when, when, when there is a huge amount of development, so obviously due to some regulation errors or something, there has been some, some pitfalls which I think is should be a bullet point for people who are in really interested to take up quantity finance, they should be aware. So, consider the financial crisis in 2008 and later on and we are seeing different banks are failing, different financial institutions are facing a problem, countries are facing a problem like in Europe, in, 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 in USA. So, what should be done? So, the main thing is that even if you know the technique is best for people who are investors, who are private players, organizations like banks, governments should use these techniques in a very somber manner such that the application areas of quantitative finance using the techniques which we learned can be utilized in the best possible way to garner the overall the in-depth knowledge a person has in trying to utilize these quantitative techniques in finance. And I am sure that people who have the background, who have the knowledge, who have the, the sophistication, who have the, the knowledge of the society can definitely use quantity finance in a very big way in trying to make their mark in this exciting field which you are going to see in years to come. And I am sure it will be a very exciting learning tool for all the participants who, who will take quantity finance as a, as, a, as a subject in years to come. Thank you and I, am, and I wish all the participants all the best and best of luck for the programs they will take. Thank you.